Come on, Bridge Church, make some noise. Come on. Hands up, eyes closed. God, we thank you for how great you are. God, we thank you that you're greater than anything we face, God. You're greater than any circumstance we're going through, God. You're greater than any dream we have, Lord. You are greater. And so this morning, we thank you that we get to experience how great, how good, how mighty, and how awesome you are. God, we say thank you. Thank you for who you are. God, thank you for who you are. God, we love you. We praise you. We believe you. And if you believe it, Bridge Church, say he's great. Say he's great. He's great. He's great. In Jesus' name, high five somebody. High five three people. Tell him he's great. He's great. Look to the person sitting next to you. And just sing it. How great. Just go ahead, sing it. Just like Allison just sang it. Just sing it just like that. Man, how great is our worship team. Come on. Isn't it so fun being surrounded with people that get to talk about the goodness of God? I love Allison's story, and, and sometimes we just need to be reminded, and when we hear stories, it reminds us that the God we serve is great. He's great. He's great. Well, we got some people at our church who are great, too, and I just want to, before we get started and, and, and share this message, I, I want to give a few uh, shout-outs. Number one, I want to give a shout-out to Chad Lee. Chad Lee is on our team. He's in the back. Just wave your hand. Chad's responsible for all of our, our sound, and, and so Chad's here, and, and I'm telling you, if you knew where we come from, you would be so thankful for where we are. And Chad, when it comes to sound, and the fact that you can hear my voice right now is a result of Chad, and Chad, Chad along with Chris Kirby, who was back here on the keys earlier, amazing young leader, they spent the entire week putting up these sound panels that we see in the back. Everybody just look back there. Look at those sound panels. They're not only effective, but they look beautiful. Incredible job. You have no idea how long it took to put those sound panels up. But I can tell you that we all get to experience the benefit of those sound panels. Our sound is getting better. That's a good thing. We no longer have to things in our ears to uh, block some of the sounds, even though I know you guys wanted some earplugs when I started singing there for a little bit. I'm so thankful for Chad. Another shout out is, I don't know if you guys know this, I didn't know this actually until uh, earlier this morning, but today is Grandparents Day. Did you know that? Do we have any grandparents? If you are a grandparent, can you just stand up real fast or at least just wave your hand in the air so we can see you? Come on. We love our grandparents. My grandfather is sitting back there in the middle. So good to see you, Grandpa Dotzler. I love what John Maxwell says. He says, grandchildren are God's gift to you for not killing your children. Because how many people know your children sometimes can be a challenge? But grandchildren are incredible. Grandparents are incredible. We're so thankful for our grandparents here. And, and so we just want to honor you and say thank you for who you are and what you do. Well, I want to jump into our, our series. And last week, uh, Joey kicked us off. Wasn't it powerful having Joey kick us off last week? Joey kicked us off with an incredible message, and we started this series, and I love the, the title of this series. I got I to gotta give props to Pastor Rob for coming up with the title of this series, but the title of our series is this idea of unlearn. Unlearn, and the subheading is culture lies. Unlearn. When I heard the title of this series, I said, man, I got to speak at least one time. 
I, I, I love this series because there's so many things as I look at scripture and as I look at our lives, there's so many things that our culture teaches us that aren't actually biblical. There's so many things that we learn growing up that if we're not careful, we'll think that what we learned growing up is the right way. I know some of us have grown up in, in really tough family environments and maybe didn't have a lot of structure, maybe didn't have a lot of parental guidance, maybe didn't have parents who spoke into your life very much. And so you grew up and you knew what you experienced wasn't right. You, 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 you knew it wasn't right. Then there's, there's others who, who grew up and had a, a great mom and a great dad and pa- family and, and parents who were there and who supported you and who loved you and who cared about you and, and who made you uh, lunches and, and spent their Sundays making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, five of them, for the rest of the week so that your kids can have exactly what they want in their lunchbox for school. You guys know what my Sundays look like. Some of us grew up in, 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 in these great homes, and some of us didn't grow up in such great homes. And, and can I tell you, it's actually s- somewhat of a blessing growing up in a home where you knew what you experienced wasn't right. Because even if you grew up in a great family, in a great home, everything you learned and experienced isn't right. Can I just say that? Everything you learned, everything you may have thought was right, might not be right. Because I know one thing. Jesus, the only person who ever lived who was perfect, was not your daddy. Now, I mean, your earthly daddy. And Jesus was the only one who was perfect. There's this thing called the Enneagram. Anybody familiar with the Enneagram? The Enneagram, it's like the latest, greatest test. Don't call it a personality test because it's not a personality test. But it, it, it helps you discover more of who you are. And, and my wife, I'll just say she's a little obsessed with this. And, 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 and the way this, this, this Enneagram works is, is you're basically a number. One, a two, a three, a four, a five, a six, a seven, an eight, or a nine. Just, just for the sake of fun, what number do you think I am? Number one. Come on, guys. I mean, I, I thought that was, oh, that was an easy one. I was setting you up. I, so I technically am a number one. And, and a number one, not just in your hearts I'm a number one, but on the Enneagram I'm a number one. And a, and a number one is called the reformer. Another word for number one is the perfectionist. Now, if you told me I was a perfectionist, I would tell you how wrong you are. But as I've learned about the reformer and the one and, and what that means, we are, we are true to our core. We like what we say is what we mean. I mean, like when I read the definition, it's like somebody is talking about me. And in this description, it talks about when you're healthy versus unhealthy and where you lean and don't lean. My wife, on the other hand, she's a nine. Now, together, we are a (laughs) ten. Holla at your boy. She's a nine, a ten in my eyes. But she is a nine, and a nine is a peacemaker. A nine is a peacemaker. Somebody say, oh. So, like, she is this beautiful, like, when people hang out with her, they, they, they always make the comment, they say, man, I just feel so peaceful. Nobody's ever said that when they hung out with me. <laughs> but every time they hang out with her, they say, man, I, I feel so peaceful. And, and so she, she, she carries this, this peace about her, and, and you look at the strengths, and you read them, and she's been reading and looking into it a lot, and it perfectly describes her. And you can go down the line, and there's different numbers that describe different things. Pastor, uh, we, we actually have a handful of pastors at our church that are the number seven. <laughs> Pastor Rob, number seven. Perfection. Seven is the number of perfection in the Bible. You guys are waiting for the punchline, the joke. But sevens are known as the enthusiasts. They love to have fun. They love to 
I mean, they are some enthusiastic, adventure-seeking people. And so you can just imagine at the office, you know, I'm sitting there, I'm trying to study and do work and stuff, and they come in, hey, Josh, what's up, man? How you doing, man? And so it's, ama- it, it, it's so fascinating and amazing, though, to really understand who we are and our personalities because what they'll say is number ones need number sevens because we're so serious. You can probably feel that when I'm speaking sometimes. Why is that brother so serious? I need sevens in my life. Number ones need nines because nines bring this, this peace and this joy. And so my wife and I, we complement each other. But can I tell you, not understanding each other, we compete against each other. And so growing up, I would tell her why my way of thinking and doing life was right. And, and she would say why her thinking and and her way of doing life was right. But what we realized is while both of us had great upbringings and we both learned a lot of great things, there were things that were inconsistent with the Bible. And so we reckoned, we were were talking the other day about the Enneagram, and, and we said, man, Jesus was probably the only one that embodied all nine healthy characteristics, but while we were on earth, nobody else will embody all those. He's the only perfect picture. He's the only whole person. So personality assessments and understanding who we are is great, but what we have to understand is that none of us are perfect. There's always a gap. And so there's things that we've learned in culture that we have to unlearn. I love the definition of unlearn. This is what the definition of unlearn is. It's to discard something learned especially a bad habit or false or outdated information. Some of the things we know are false and or outdated. And the Bible gives us a picture of how we can unlearn those things. Last week, Pastor Joey kicked it off, and he talked about this idea of purpose. And if you and I, if we've grown up in America, there's this thing called the American dream, and if we're not careful, we'll go after the American dream versus God's dream. Those purposes look very different. And today I want to I talk about it and I want us to, 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 to try to unlearn this idea of church. Church. I like that. I want us to un- unlearn this idea of church because we all have a perception of what church is. Just by a show of hands, how many people grew up in the church? A lot of people grew up in the church. I know a lot of people didn't grow up in the church. If you grew up in the church, maybe you had a good experience, maybe you had a bad experience, but your experiences led to your perception of what church is all about. Those who didn't grow up in the church, you're like, man, what what is this thing called church? You ever uh, have a conversation with somebody? I tend to do this when I'm talking to people. I tend to get to a point where, where I ask them this question, do you go to church anywhere? Do you go to church anywhere? And it's amazing the responses that you get. I mean, you, you, you mentioned the word church, and some people just start looking at you crazy. You say, what? When, when, when I'm talking to people, and people say, what do you do for a living? Uh, 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 pastor, what do you do for a living? <laughs> I try not to, I'm not going to lie, I try not to tell people at least right up front that I'm a pastor, because they start acting weird. They go from, hey, what's up, man? Hey, how you doing? Hey, I'm I'm not even going to lie, and I'm not going to put anybody on blast, but it just happened this morning. (laughs) Hey, man, what's up, dude? Hey, how you doing? Hey, man, good, good, good to see you, man. Hey, oh, yeah, this is one of our pastors. Oh, how you doing? (laughs) I'm like, hey, I'm just a brother like you. Brother, from another, I mean, but, but, but like if you tell them you're a pastor, I mean, they'll, 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 they'll start, you know, watching what they say. They'll say a cuss word, oh, my bad, pastor. <laughs> hey, no judgment here. I don't condone cussing, but you don't have to try to act a certain way around me. Actually, one of my, one of my favorite, one of my favorite, and I'm not encouraging us to do this, but one of my favorite encouragements of all time was when somebody came up to me one Sunday morning after church and, 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 and gave me a hug. And this was uh, uh, an older lady. And she said, Pastor Josh, you're my favorite bleeping pastor. She didn't use the word bleeping, though. She said something else. 
I said, I like how you're just keeping it real right now. <laughs> but, but people literally, when you tell them you're a pastor, when you tell them you're a part of a church, there's certain filters and there's a certain connotation that they have. And they start to act and start to, to, to treat you in a, in a certain way. And I believe that, that today, because of what happened years ago, our perception of the church is different than God's intention for the church. And if we're not careful, we'll think of the church as a place that we go. We'll think of a church as a location. But God's heart is that the church is people who are living out God's plan and purposes on earth. Church is not a place. How many people woke up this morning and said, let's go to church? I'm, I'm, I'll be honest. I, I, I told our, our son, he's sitting there, I said, it's time to go to church today. Let's go to church. I think a lot of times church has a place, but it's people. Somebody look at somebody say, people. Look at somebody say, you're the church. It's people living out God's plan. One of the ways we say it here at Bridge Church is it's changed people who change the world. It's not an organization. It's a group of people who are on mission. And if we'll understand the, the difference between what church is and, and, and maybe sometimes what we think church is, we'll be able to experience and live out God's original plan for the church. I want to look at a passage in Acts, the book of Acts. Now, if you're, if you're reading the Bible and you're reading through Scripture, there's the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament represents books and, and, and Scriptures that all happened before Jesus, B.C., before Christ. The New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, starts with books that describe Jesus' life, and then it, it goes into the book of Acts, which talks about the early church, people who followed Jesus, made a decision to put their faith and trust in him and, and believed in what he said, and then the church in Acts starts to, to, to happen and play out. This is where we get the beginning of our church. In Acts chapter 17, starting, to, starting in, in verse 2, it says, as Paul's custom, now, now Paul was one of the followers of Jesus where in the New Testament, he wrote two-thirds of the scripture. That's a lot. So he's known for, for what he did and what he wrote, and, and Paul has a powerful story. It says, as Paul's custom, he went to the synagogue service for three Sabbaths in a row. He used the scriptures to reason with the people. It said he explained the prophecies and prove that the Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead. Talking about Jesus. Jesus' life was predicted. His death was predicted. The Messiah, the Savior of the world, he would come. He would die. And he would be raised to life. And because he would be raised to life, he would make a way for every single one of us to experience new life. And so Paul's telling people about this. He, he's basically at a, a church service explaining what the scriptures foretold. It says, this Jesus I'm telling you about is the Messiah. It says, some of the Jews who listened were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas along with many God-fearing Greek men and quite a few prominent women. Now, it was important to understand that, you know, a lot of us, when we show up at church, we have a common belief system. We have a, a common belief system, and in, in, in we believe in, in Jesus and what he did. And what he stood for. Paul is speaking to a group of people who didn't necessarily believe or even know who Jesus was. They believed in something, but not Jesus. Many of them during these, this time period, they put their faith and trust in whoever was the, the king or ruler in that day. They put their faith and in, in trust in, in, in gods and in other religious symbols, but they Many of them didn't know or have their faith and trust in Jesus. It says Paul persuaded them to join. Verse 5. It says, but some of the Jews were jealous. Some of them didn't like what was happening, so they gathered some troublemakers from the marketplace to form a mob and to start a riot. They attacked the home of Jason, searching for Paul and Silas so they could drag them out 
to the crowd. In other words, as Paul was talking about Jesus, many of the people who were listening, it said he persuaded them, and they said, you know what? I want to follow Jesus. Now, back then, when they said, I want to follow Jesus, their entire world changed. Everything about what they believed changed. Back then, people, people carried, oh, uh, there was a weight that, that was with this world, word belief. It wasn't just an idea. It shifted everything about who they were. So, so when they believed in the, 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 the ruler of that day, they, they gave towards that ruler. They worshiped that ruler. They talked about that ruler. The Bible says even at times unhealthily, they sacrificed their children on the altar for that ruler or for that God. And so when they shifted their belief system from there to this person of Jesus, their money went to Jesus. Their worship went from those people in that city to Jesus. Everything about their life changed. Wow. Everything about their life looked different. That's what's so powerful, and sometimes we don't fully understand this. I mean, just to, 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 to give you a, a, maybe a picture of what this looks like, it would be like, like somebody who is a diehard Creighton Blue Jay fan. One day waking up and saying, I'm about to become a Nebraska fan. I'm changing sides. I'm changing teams. I'm selling everything I, I had that was blue. I'm buying all red, not the Crips versus the Bloods, but I'm going all in for Nebraska. It'd be similar to that, though, too. You're shifting your entire allegiance to a new team. Can you imagine the fallout? Iowegians, man going from an Iowa Hawkeye to a Nebraska Cornhusker. There's a shift. Now, we know neither of those scenarios would ever happen. But that's what's happening here. People are believing and worshiping and giving and, and, and pointing to a God they shift to another God, this God named Jesus, and the people in the city didn't like it because they start to shift their wealth and resources in a new direction. So they form a mob to start a riot. So they go to Jason's house and says, not finding them there, they dragged out Jason and some of the other believers instead and took them before the city council. Paul and Silas have caused trouble all over the world. This is the accusation that... They're saying against Paul and Silas. It says, now they are here disturbing our city too. One translation in the Bible. It says, these are they who have turned the world upside down. And they're here in our city doing the same thing. Because of what they were proclaiming, because of who they were pointing people to, people in the city didn't like it, and so they wanted to do everything to take Paul and Silas out. They had a reputation, and their reputation was for pointing people to Jesus. This was the picture of the church that Jesus talked about. It's the picture of what God's original intent was. Now, in Matthew chapter 16, Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. It's the first time we see the word church used in Scripture. It's before there even was a thing called church. Jesus is, is talking to his followers, and, and, and at the time, people were saying and, and pointing to Jesus, and they were saying, man, Jesus, I, I think he's a prophet. I, I think he's a teacher. I think he's all these things, but they didn't really know who he was. And so he's hanging out with his followers, and he looks at his followers, and he says, who do you say that I am? People are saying all these things, trying to understand who I am. Who do you say that I am? Peter raises his hand. Peter had a loud mouth in Scripture. He was always the first one to speak. And he, and he said, Jesus, you are, you are the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And, and Jesus looks at Peter and says, yeah, you're right. I am. And then, and then Jesus makes this statement. He says, 
I now say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, in other words, upon Jesus, upon himself, he said, I will build my church. And all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Can I tell you that there's one person building the church and his name is Jesus? It does not say that Josh will build my church, Ron will build my church, Rob will build my church. Jesus is building his church. When we join the church, we're not following a leader. We're following a Savior named Jesus. Jesus says, for the very first time in history, I will build my church. This is why I love being a part of the church. Because it's about Jesus. And he says, get this, the power of hell will not conquer it. No power on earth, no power in hell, even though the enemy wants to kill, steal, and destroy, there is nothing that can conquer the local church. And you know how we know this? You know how we know this? Because he made this declaration over 2,000 years ago, and 2,000 years later, we are meeting here, and we are a part of the church. Wow. Wow. 2,000 years later, people all over the world are saying, I want to be a part of the church. The most powerful force on the universe is the church. But we need to make sure that we understand that we are the church. See, it's important to understand that when Jesus said this 2,000 years ago, Jesus didn't use the word church. Jesus, when, when he said this, used the word ecclesia. Look at the neighbor and say, man, you are looking real ecclesia today. <laughs> Use that as a pickup line. Let me take you to my ecclesia. I don't even know what that means, but it just sounds good. See, ecclesia, Jesus used this word ecclesia. While most of the Bible is translated into Greek, this Greek word ecclesia means people who gather on purpose. And so today, when, when we tell people, hey, man, what church do you go to? Or I'm going to church today, or church this, church that, they give us kind of that, that, that look like, man, church, that's for, that's for those types of people. The word ecclesia wasn't a religious term. The word ecclesia actually referred, a lot of times they were talking about either political groups of people who would gather for a purpose or, 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 or soldiers and, and people in the military who would gather for a purpose and understand their mission and they would go live out this mission. It was never about a location. It was always about a mission. It was about purpose. And so Jesus used this word ecclesia when he was talking in Matthew 16. And as the, the church began to grow, as this gathering of people on a mission, people who were willing to give up what they knew to follow somebody they believed in, thousands started to do it. And the church grew, and if you made that decision, your life was on the line. And, and, and the, the empire, the Roman Empire, was against Christianity and tried to kill Christianity. And one day, one of the leaders, Constantine of the Roman Empire, actually declared himself a Christian. He said, if I can't kill these Christians, I'm going to join them. If you can't beat them, join them. And so one day, this, this Roman Empire actually declared himself a Christian, and it started to become cool to be a Christian. Before that, it wasn't cool to be a Christian. And so he declares himself a Christian, and he's this man in power, and because he's a Christian, all these nobles and, and people around start to say, man, I'm a Christian too. And, and, and because tradition was so big in the Roman Empire, they started to build tradition around what they were now believing. Just to give you a small example where we maybe get some of our traditions from, people who were Christians used to go beside graves and they would take communion to remember Jesus and to remember those that had passed away. 
And as Christianity became more of a tradition, they started to erect buildings around and over grave sites, and they started to put uh, the, 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 the place where the person was buried as the center place in these buildings where communion would take place. Some of us have come from traditions where we do this. And, and it, it's a result of, of Constantine and the Roman Empire and starting to create tradition around Christianity. And the word church, while most of the Bible is translated in Greek, the word church actually comes from Germany. It's a German word. And this word, as Constantine grew and, and, and Christianity became popular, they started to erect and build these big buildings where people could come and they could worship and they could have church. And so ecclesia means people on purpose, but church comes from this, this German word, kirch, which means house of the Lord. In other words, the church shifted from People to a place. From people that would gather on mission and on purpose to a place we would go to, sing some songs, talk about God, but then go back to lives as, as usual and as normal. But it was never the original intent. God's heart was that the church would be people who had an encounter with Jesus and began to live and walk and worship and give, and everything about their lives would move from what they thought was important and what they used to believe in to now Jesus, who they now know and believe is who he says he is. Everything changed. And so today, for many years, if you were to go plant a church and you were to go sign a, start a church and, and you were to fill out the paperwork, it says that you can do worship-type activities. The church today tries to, to condense Christianity into the four walls of a building. But the church in the Old Testament, as we see Paul and Silas out there and sharing and declaring, we see that it was a church that was out of the seats and into the streets and, and have an impact everywhere it went. That's why we say as a church, we can't just be about what's inside the four walls of this building. God's church is so much bigger. People are waiting to encounter Jesus. But over the years, if we're not careful, we've been fed by our culture, by well-intended people. This is what the church is, but it's not consistent with God's heart. See, I think the uh, Apostle Paul, who wrote this, who, 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 who was the main character in this Acts chapter 17. We see Paul's life and, and Paul and Silas are out there and they're sharing and, and people are making a decision to follow Jesus. But what you need to know about Paul is before he was out there declaring and, and before he was out there sharing, Paul was preaching to people who represented who he once was. See, the, the Apostle Paul, before he was getting chased by a mob, he was the mob. Before Paul made a decision to follow Jesus and become a Christian, he was killing Christians. Wow. And so Paul, who we see in this story, who, who's out there talking about Jesus and is a champion for his faith, Paul was a, a Christian killer. And it says Paul was on his way to, to arrest and, and go after more Christians. And on his way, he had an encounter with Jesus. It says God knocked him off his horse. And Paul got up and he was blind. And for three days, Paul was blind. And God sends a guy to Paul and, and, and gives him this message from God. Paul, why are you persecuting me? Paul... Because of his experience and, and his encounter with Jesus, he decides to shift his allegiance from the Roman Empire to Jesus. He decides to make a change. And then the Bible says after Paul made that change, he went and started to hang out with the believers, the early followers of Jesus. 
And those who professed to be Christians were actually scared of Paul. They're like, wasn't he the guy killing Christians? I don't want to be around him. And they're like, no, 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 Paul. He, his life is changing. Things are turning for the better. They're like, Paul? Yeah, yeah Paul. You know. And so Paul, we, we, we see him make this decision, and then he, he joins the family of believers. And then before you know it, Paul gets called out, and, and Paul goes out, and he starts proclaiming and declaring the goodness of Jesus. You talk about a radical life change. Paul had a personal encounter with Jesus. He had a personal encounter with Jesus. And, and one of the challenges with, with church, when we think it's a place, it becomes organizational. This place we go, this organism that we join. But it was never about this, this organization. It was never organizational. It was always personal. The church is always about having a personal encounter with Jesus. In the beginning of Acts, we see when the Bible started, Jesus tells his followers, he says, I'm getting ready to leave. He said, but, but, but when, I, when I leave, you're going to uh, receive the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's going to be with you, and the Holy Spirit's going to guide you. And, and it says that after they followed him, they were meeting together. And the Holy Spirit came, and they received power. And out of that power, people started to wonder, man, what's happening? People are acting a little crazy, a little funny. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. Are they drunk? They said, no, that's what Jesus talked about. And then Peter stands up. And just like we saw, just what Paul did, Peter starts talking about Jesus. And it says 3,000 people made a decision to turn from what they thought was right to start to follow and serve God. After they made a decision, they were baptized, and then they joined the family of believers and started to get together in homes and hang out. And then the very next day, Peter and John go to pray, and they encounter somebody. We see this, this cycle of the church, this cycle, and we see it in Paul's life, and we see it in our life. And, and, and number one, we see that it's personal because it, it starts when God changes us. When God in, encounters every single one of us. And then number two, we get connected to a community of people who love us, who care about us, who want to support us. And as we get connected, we start to step out and we start to be a part of God's plan to change the world. We become a champion for our faith. That's what a world changer is. It's somebody who says, because of what I believe, wherever I am, I'm going to champion my faith. I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to tell people about it. I'm going to help other people experience it. Paul was changed by God. Personal. Paul got connected to a community. And then God said, Paul, I want to use you to change the world. That's what the church is. See, for me, God changed my life. When I said yes to Jesus, he started, it'll never end, but he started to change me. Got connected to a community of people. I would not be where I am today if not for the people surrounding my life. If not for this church, for the people in this church, for those that have supported me. And it's only but because of that that I can be a part of using my gifts to impact the world around me. I love this morning talking to my girl. I'm kept putting her on blast with my girl Nancy over here. Nancy, you've been sober for how many days? Spoke free. Six months. How, how, how many days? 189 days but nobody's counting. I'm talking to her before church. And, and I've been in, seeing and in relationship with Nancy for a while. And can I tell you, God is changing her. 
But number two, the thing I love when I talk to her, she talks about the community of people that text her and support her and encourage her. She is connected to a community. And today she is using her influence in her neighborhood and wherever she goes to talk about and champion the goodness of God. It's personal. We're not a part of an organization. We're a part of a movement of people who gather on mission. I love when I I see young people. He's not in here because he's probably serving. But my brother Josiah, he's how old is he, 14? He's 14 years old. And he said, God changed me. And I was at his school one day doing a chapel. And everybody's singing. And all the kids are, are standing up singing. And all the kids are too, too cool for school. There's one boy in the corner with hands raised, worshiping God. I'll never forget that image. To see a young boy at such a young age say, God, change me. He serves consistently at our church. And the reason he's where he is today is because he's connected to a community of people that love him, support him, encourage him, believe in him, call out the gold in him. And I'm telling you, even at a young age, God is using him to change the world and champion his faith. I could go across this room and, and, and mention person after person that when we say yes to following Jesus, We don't join this organization. We join his family of believers. He starts to change us. We make a decision, get connected, and then he starts to use us to change the world. And so I just believe, I believe that when we really understand God's heart for the church, it changes the way we live. We don't leave here today saying, man, church was great. I'm so glad we had church today. No, we walk out saying, man, I get to be the church. I get to be a part of the church. I get to live the church. I get to champion my faith. I get to be a part of something that's so much bigger than Bridge Church, but it's the church of people around the world who have made a decision to shift their focus, to shift their faith, to shift their resources to God's plan for us while we're here on earth. And so I just want to encourage us as we get ready to close. The church is a group of people who have been changed by God and have committed to allowing God to use them to change the world. That that church in Acts 17, 6, they were known as turning the world upside down. But the reason they turned the world upside down is because they allowed God to turn their world upside down. And so I believe that some of us in here today need to invite Jesus to turn our world around. We've been going after stuff. We've been chasing stuff. And Jesus says that I've been chasing you. I want a relationship with you. I want this thing to be personal. I don't want you to just show up on Sundays. I want to do something in your life that's going to forever change who you are. I want it to be personal. And so with Eyes closed. Head bowed. Maybe you're like the Apostle Paul and you were running from God. You were doing things against God. But God says, I want a relationship with you. Maybe you're here today and you need to say yes and you need to invite Jesus to start to change you. So you can join his family. It's so simple. Everything doesn't change all in one day. But when we make a decision... God starts to change us daily. We start to walk in a new reality. And and when we get connected to his family, bridge groups are so huge. Connect groups are so huge because it gets us connected to God's family. Maybe you're here today and you'd say, man, Josh, I I need to make a decision today to put my faith and trust in Jesus. I'm gonna count to three. When I count to three, I just want you to put your hand in the air. One, if God is whispering to you, I'm telling you, just respond by faith. Two, three. Just hands up. Hands up. Man, Josh, I just want to put my faith and trust in Jesus. I want to put my faith and trust in Jesus. Come on. 
Come on, I, I want all of us to repeat this prayer together. Say, dear Jesus, I want to be a part of your church. I want to be a part of your family. But I need you to change me. Today, I'm making a decision to put my faith, my trust, and my hope in you. I don't want to ever be the same. Lord, change me so you can use me to change the world. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I know there was hands. Come on. Yeah, you can make some noise. Come on. The Bible says that all of heaven rejoices when one person makes a decision to follow Jesus. And there was hands raised all across this room. But this is what I need us to do. I'm so glad if you raised your hand and you say, man, I want to make that decision. I've got a, uh, some things I want you to do. Number one, you've got to let us know about it. You've got to tell somebody. We want to get you connected. We want you to go to the Welcome Center and let somebody know. We got baptism in a couple of weeks, and the Bible says that they believed and they were baptized. Baptism is an outward expression of an inward decision that we've made. And so in a couple of weeks, we have baptism, and we want to celebrate. We want to baptize. We want to help you declare in front of your church family, this is the direction that I'm going with my life. So number one, look at somebody and say, you got to let them know. You can't keep it to yourself. You got to let us know. Number two, number two, maybe you, you made that decision today, or maybe you've already made that decision. Can I tell you, you have to get connected to a community. And if you're here today and you would say, Bridge Church, man, I, I claim Bridge Church as my church. You have to be in a connect group. We can't just show up on Sunday mornings and expect to grow and become who God's called us to be. We've got to become intimately connected to his family. I can tell stories for days about how every single one of us needs community. But I just want to encourage you, if you're here and you'd say, man, I haven't, I haven't signed up for a connect group. You have to sign up today. Don't leave without signing up for a connect group. Ultimately, God will be able to use every single one of us to change the world. Amen? Amen. Amen. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for what you shared today. Lord, I thank you for your church in the original meaning. God, not a place, but a people who live life on purpose. God, we say thank you for allowing us to be a part of your purposes. In Jesus' name, if you believe it, Bridge Church, say, that's what's up. That's what's up. That's what's up. Come on. Well, you can stand up, and as you leave, you got to hug four people. You've got to high five three people, and you've got to encourage at least one person. You guys have a great, great rest of the day. Love you guys.